right, I think we'll we'll get started um, just with a short introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we're delighted to have people here for our first webinar of 2024 and Happy New Year, um, if you celebrate New Year at this time. So um, first we'll have uh, three speakers. First we'll have Ellen Joan Van Vliet from uh, Qualicore Europe. So Ellen Joan is the CEO of Qualicore Europe. As she has a lot of experience as an executive director, but also in nursing as well, and um, has been a member of the ISQA board since 2019, but also on the board of the ISQA's External Evaluation Organization or Association. So uh, we're delighted to hear from Ellen Joan today. Um, and also Karsten Engel, who is the CEO of ISQA since 2021. And Karsten has been a deputy CEO of the accreditation, Danish accreditation. Sorry, Karsten. <laughs> I cast <laughs> um, before this, and also the um a member of the ISQA board and the ISQA External Evaluation Association as well. Um, and for five years, Karsten was also deputy chair of the ISQA um external evaluation association. So we're delighted to have them here today to discuss um, the topic that they they recently co-authored in our journal. Um, and I think Luke is going to add a link later on to the chat. So just keep an eye there if you want to read this article. Um, and also, uh, if you have any questions, we'll get to them at the end. So we'd love you to pop any questions throughout the, the webinar into the Q&A box, which is just down the bottom of your screen there. Um, and as Luke mentioned as well in the chat there, we're going to record this session. So uh, once it's it's edited and it's available on our YouTube channel, um, we'd advise you to share that with your networks and also subscribe to our YouTube channel because we have webinars added there um, every few weeks. And uh, it's, it's a great resource to have. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ellen Joan now, and I hope you enjoy this um this webinar first one in 2024 thanks hello everyone so good morning good afternoon good evening my name is ellen joan van fleet and thank you for the nice introduction katriona so in the upcoming hour we will share with you lessons learned from four of my colleagues around the world we examined how accreditation programs have been implemented in australia Botswana, denmark and jordan we compared goals, program implementation, reported outcomes, and we identified enablers and barriers to derive common key learnings. So the results are published in the International Journal for Quality in Healthcare. And I would like to thank my co-authors and colleagues for sharing their experience and their expertise. And obviously we recommend you all to download this, this paper and read it. It's free accessible for ISQA members. So the four cases were presented by members of the ISQA Accreditation Council, ACHS, COSASA, ICAS, and HCAC. We start in alphabetical order. The Australian government established in 2011 a federal agency to develop national safety and quality standards. The Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. The standards were developed in collaboration with jurisdictions, technical experts, and a wide range of stakeholders, including health professionals and patients. The federal agency approved six accreditation bodies, among which AC, ACHS to assess health services against the standards. To be approved, you had to be ISQA accredited. In Botswana, the Ministry of Health and Wellness contracted COSASA to implement a program for external evaluation. In 2009, the first pilot was enrolled in district hospitals and primary healthcare clinics. In 2014, the Ministry commissioned COSASA to develop standards for all types of healthcare facilities and roll out these standards across Botswana. For Danish, the Danish case with ICAS will be presented by Karsten. And finally, Jordan, in 2004, a national committee from all healthcare stakeholders was established as part of a USAID project to look at how hospitals could comply with quality and patient safety requirement. And in 2007, 
ACAC was established as an independent accreditation organization to set standards and measure against them. These cases were selected because they were very information rich and had a geographical mix. And now we go to Denmark and Carsten, I hand over to you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Ellen Joan. So let's begin with taking a closer look at Denmark. I will mainly, uh, sorry, one slide back, please. I will begin with presenting to you our experience from accreditation of primary care clinics in Denmark. Accreditation in, pri in primary care began in late 2015. I was personally involved in this as a member of the leadership team of the Danish accreditation body, but the research I refer to was not, I was not involved in that in any way. It was performed by independent academic researchers. Throughout the presentation, I will use the word clinic to designate the organizational unit that provides primary care services. An example would be a group of one to several general practitioners and the nurses or admin workers associated with them. Accreditation in general practice was followed by a large research project that resulted in several publications from which we can draw a number of conclusions about the implementation of standards. And I'll present some, some of the findings to you. Hospital accreditation was also subject to research Accreditation performance was compared to other types of data, including mortality, readmissions, length of stay, and adherence to clinical guidelines as measured by numerical indicators, but this is not on today's agenda. Next. I will not talk you through this figure. It's how we structure the paper, but I would I'd like to point out to you the three questions, why, how, and what. This is what frames our discussion in the paper, but it's also useful to think about when you think of implementation. Sometimes you have too much focus on the how and you underestimate the importance of clarifying and communicating the why and do not pay attention to, in, to ensuring what exactly what is and uh, whether it's achieved. Next. First, a little bit of context for clinic accreditation in Denmark. It's a country with a population of 5.9 million. The primary care services are provided by five regions led by elected politicians. Actual services are, however, provided by independent privately owned clinics that work under a collective agreement between regions and professional associations. An individual provider can obtain a permit to operate under this agreement and the number of the geographic spread of permits is regulated. Access to GP services is free, financed by taxes. For some, some of the other primary care services, there's some co-payment by patients. And there's very little room, as you can understand, for GPs to practice outside this frame. So to be a GP, you must be a part of this collective agreement. Next. Now back to the origins of accreditation. In Denmark, it was first introduced to hospitals by a coalition of national, regional, and local governments and the Danish Health Authority. It was introduced as part of the National Strategy for Quality Development in Healthcare 2002 to 2006. But as it takes time to, to develop a program, the first surveys were actually in 2010. But the, the ori originators was an alliance between those politically accountable to the electorate for providing healthcare policymakers, funders, and main operators, not patient representatives, although politicians in some sense may see them as, as that as well, and also not professional associations at this stage, although professionals were involved in the development of the standards. In the clinic sectors, accreditation was actually by mutual agreement, as I will outline to you in a moment. Next. Why? Accreditation was introduced uh, uh, as a tool for systematic external assessment of healthcare quality, intended to support uh, quality uh, development. But notice the key words when you read the documentation, assessment, transparency, common, which implicates elimination of unwarranted variation. We want everyone to deliver healthcare of the same quality. But 
it was stated as a tool for assessment, not for quality improvement, but of course with the underlying assumption that if the assessment resulted in the identification of gaps, which was expected, then initiatives would be taken to improve performance. Next. When we came to introduce accreditation in clinics, the standard uh, content was developed to focus on adherence to patient safety critical procedures and to the creation of a good quality culture by which, by which we mean use of data, use of audit, learning from adverse events, collection and use of data and patient experience, development of state, staff competency, and adherence to uh, clinical guidelines. Eventually, accreditation was abandoned by the English healthcare. Some of the data I'll show you later may help to, explain, it help to explain why, but it was stated that once implemented, accreditation had, so to speak, done the job. There was now a decision to make a shift from external assessment to internal assessment supported by centrally collected data. Um, um, yeah, But note that external evaluation was not abandoned per se. The regulator, the Danish Patient Safety Authority, continues to make inspection visits, including a standards-based assessment. The scope and the coverage are more focused. It's not, we're not talking about regular visits to all clinics with assessment over a broad range of criteria. And focus in this inspection, in these inspections, is on safety and compliance with normative regulation. Next. Um, between 2015 and 2020, six accreditation programs for different types of primary care services were initiated. They included GPs, specialist physicians, chiropractors, physiotherapists, chiropodists, and clinical psychologists. Uh, the agreements provided inclusion, uh, provided uh, provision for implementation support to clinics, and there was a um, financial incentive, a bonus, bonus for achieving accreditation. The, act, the actual setup of support varied between uh, uh, types of clinics. For GPs, existing quality networks based in each, each of the five regions were used to provide support. Each network has a staff, including GPs working part-time in this role and engages clinicians working in that region. The accreditation body it does not interact directly with clinics, but instead trained and supported re regional quality units and held regular meetings with representatives from all units to ensure a uniform understanding of the standards. There was a financial incentive, but more importantly, failure to achieve accreditation could be considered a breach of contract and would result in scrutiny and difficult conversations with the region they contracted with. Ultimately, Loss of the right to practice with public funding could be lost, but, and this was not just an empty threat, it was used, al although in a very uh, few cases. Next, please. One thing is what the central stakeholders, the regions and the leaders of the professional associations agreed was the aim and purpose of accreditation. Another thing is, as we know, that people on the floor, they make their own opinion. In this case, two trends were obviously, and I will show you later that we have data to support it. One was the control perspective, prove to us that you did what we said you must do. And the other one was the quality improvement perspective, explore your processes supported by standards and surveyors and use the findings to guide improvement. Next. A little bit more about the support provided for GP. There were many types were provided, and they can be grouped into three general categories. One is personal interaction initiated by the regions, what we hear called regional meetings, ranging from traditional information meeting where we come and tell you a lot of things, to uh, mostly in what, with one-way communication over workshops and um, with a more interactive style and. In, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, some, in some scale, there were all, also clinic visits, one-to-one -one clinic visits were offered. Then there were personal interaction in, initiated by peers, 
GP to GP, either informally or through already existing formalized networks, mostly with, with, um, under the umbrella of the professional associations who, who would set up uh, opportunities for practices to interact as group and exchange experiences. And of course, a lot of documents were produced as well by other clinics or by others. Typically, it would be the regional quality unit that, for instance, could produce examples of written procedures. Next, please. And how did the GPs use the support? A questionnaire was sent out to 608 clinics, the ones accredited first, and of those, 74% or 447 responded. As you can see, most of the, of the responders, responders used several types of support. There were altogether eight, you know, seven different types of support, and most actually you have used four, five, or six types. And uh, as not all types were offered to all clinics, it is fair to conclude that most of the clinics, clinics used most or almost all of the support types offered. Next. And uh, how did they then assess the support? You will see that while, while all support activities achieved a good rating, the best ratings, the, 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 the uh, rating is the light green uh, column. The best ratings were given to workshops where participants are involved in the structured process and in particular to visits in individual clinic, uh, clinics. You will also see that these uh, were used by fewer responders. That's not be because they didn't want to, be but because they were not offered in all regions. Clinic visits are obviously costly and were only offered to selected clinics. And based on the findings in the study, the authors recommended that future quality improvement initiatives should, should provide support that is multifaceted to target the various needs of the clinics, is independent of timing, so that each clinic can use it whenever suitable, and includes support based on collaboration between clinics as peers increase the perceived usefulness of the, uh, of the provided support. You trust more what you hear from your uh, peers than what you hear for, from some bureaucrat. Next. Another study consists of qualitative interviews with GPs and staff from 11 practices. Staff and GP were interviewed separately. And the purpose was to examine where clinics have, had experienced challenges during the accreditation process. From their findings, we can identify some enablers that can help clinics overcome the challenges. I'll give you some close, uh, quotes from the paper by Du and, and uh, co workers. The study found that understanding the requirements of the accreditation standards was experienced as a challenge. So you need to provide help to understand. The required sense-making work, work was often seen as too time-consuming and as something that could have been minimized if the standards had been more explicit. The results underline the importance of ensuring clarity in accreditation requirements and of providing easily available support, preferably with one access point that can accommodate the varying needs of the participating practices. And at the same time, the result points to the importance of carefully considering the balance between flexibility and specificity in accreditation programs. In my words, you must make sufficient room for the clinics to find their own ways to meet the standards without leaving them in total confusion about what to do. And one way is, of course, to add to the rules, um, content and guidance in the, stand in the standard that will also stimulate reflection. Not only rules, also stimulate reflection. Next. To the finding from this paper, I will add an observation from the feedback from practices to the accrediting body, ICAS. All were encouraged to provide feedback through a short net-based questionnaire after the survey. The surveyor team was almost universally praised. Even those who were skeptic or negative to the idea of accreditation remarked, but it was a good and useful experience to have a dialogue with colleagues. Using peer surveyors, in particular GPs as peer surveyors, can be expensive, but I believe it's worth the money. Next. 
the same author has presented some other results from the interviews in another paper. From this paper, we can identify some barriers, mainly that the process is burdensome and by some, but by no means by all, perceived of being of little relevance. Also, that interference with autonomy is a barrier, which is also my own observation, and that the impact of barriers vary considerably between clinics. Quote from the paper, some professionals experienced that accreditation had been a driver for positive change, while others found that the accreditation process had been too burdensome and of little relevance to improving clinical practice. Next. These are findings from the accreditation surveys. What we show you here is the number of clinics in, within each of the six practice types and within two cycles of specialist physician accreditation that at the first survey visit had findings that required a follow-up. And you will see that that was the case in between 22 and 70% uh, of the practices. And then the fraction of all clinics that achieved full compliance when they have had the opportunity to, uh, for, for a follow-up, and that was almost 100%. Um, notice that the first column does not represent a baseline. That's just, that is the findings after the clinics had had at, at least half a year to prepare for the accreditation survey with the support we already have described. So in all likelihood, the difference underestimates the effect of accreditation and proves to us that it is not enough just to give standards and guidelines. It, it seems um, likely to assume that the assessment and the dialogue with the surveyors and the requirement for a follow-up will add to the impact. Another interesting observation when looking at this uh, table is that one sector completed two cycles of accreditation. In the second cycle, the proportion requiring follow-up was not very different from what was found in the first actually a little bit higher. This was not caused by a raised bar. Standards were more or less the same, although the surveyors may have been somewhat more sharpened uh, compared to what they were when they were, when they were in the first, very first surveys were in the VC. But this does not support the idea of a ceiling effect, at least not after one cycle of accreditation. Next. And here I show you the, the most commonly found types of non-compliances, correct procedures for patient identification, you can see, see them down here, et cetera, et cetera. One thing that surprised me a little bit was that the knowledge about the reprocessing of instruments was uh, less than perfect in, in, in a number of clinics, but it was, it was improved. The next. So, now back to the question of how people who work in actual healthcare perceive accreditation. These results are from hospitals, but I believe it's not too unlikely that it could be extrapolated to clinics as well. But you will see that on the scale from one to seven, when you go from physicians over nurses to administrators and staff, people become more and more convinced that accreditation is an important tool to increase quality. Next. And what influences the perception of physicians? You may be surprised that older physicians were more supportive of accreditation than younger. Uh, but it's also interesting that if you don't know what accreditation is all about, your perception is very poor. Telling people to do something they don't understand why, 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 why they do is no good. It's, 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 it's actually better to believe it's for control that the completely uh, un unknowing. You will also, uh, what's also notable here that there were a small group of physicians, about 5%, who were extremely negative. They scored 1.0, which is absolute minimum uh, across the range of questions. Next. GPs were asked about the perception of the impact of accreditation, and not surprisingly, the Surprisingly, the impact was perceived as different depending on domain. Where you're good already, there's of course less room for improvement. But it's still surprising that almost one third thought that the handling of prescription renewals had improved. That's something a GP does many times every day. And almost 
Half believed that their that their emergency preparedness had improved, and luckily only one stubborn person believed that it had been that that the, the, the um, performance had been uh, worse because of accreditation. I have some un unpublished data I would like to share with you. It was some interim results from 2017 that were never completed or or, or, or published, but actually we found here that. Uh, Almost half of the respondents, GPs, uh, found that accreditation had improved the quality for patients in my, my practice. 44% that uh, it had improved the cooperation among professional groups in my practice. And 63% that it had made my practice better at working with quality uh, development in the future. So the perception was, was far from overall negative. Next. And what then about patients? Well, no evidence that accreditation promoted patient satisfaction and patients were largely not aware of the accreditation of the GP. We should then say that all accreditations that were, were public available, you could go to a website and see if your GP had passed or passed, but the need for follow up or failed. But accreditation was seen as a support for clinics more than as a way to inform patients. And the publication of outcomes was not seen as a part of a strategy to support patients in choosing, which would anyway not be easy in Denmark because of a relative shortage of GPs. So you more or less have to take what you can get, but as reflecting a general culture of transparency. Next. And what was special about accreditation compared to other initiatives to improve quality? Some of the punchline could, could be that, that these actually reach every clinic with some few well-defined exceptions. Um, we didn't, we, we um, GPs close to retirement were not uh, required to, to go through accreditation. It was the first that reached every clinic and engaged all staff, which you also can see from, uh, see reflected in one of the questionnaire responses I related to earlier and the peer dialogue was greatly appreciated. Next. So, um, a recipe for successful implementation could be that you need commitment from the top, but you also need to build and support involvement from the front line. You shouldn't over-focus on process. Carsten looks to be frozen. Can you hear us, Carsten? Good for you. Now I suggest I take over until we see Carsten again. Yeah, sure. The best as I can. So the recipe for the successful implementation, I think it's obviously why we asked Carsten to present this himself. He was with the build and support invol involvement from the front line, but also don't overfocus on processes and make sure that the survey is a learning experience, not an inspection. Next, Catriona. So the alignment and the buy-in is essential. So it's about how is the accreditation process and content and standards, how is it aligned with the organization, with the belief, with the context and with the service delivery? Is there coherence? that really en enables and allows organizational buy-in. But also the organizational action in response to observation, feedback, or self-reflection resulting from the accreditation process is important. Is there a response and how do you keep it alive? What you find is your improvement potential. And um, I think that is actually excellently in this uh, paper uh, presented, like the true value of accreditation result. It's not an add-on project. It's someone that you have, it's an activity that you really have to build in your organization and use it as a continuous journey to improve your process and really allows and facilitates the exchange and translation of knowledge. Next. 
Um, obviously, there has been a, a lot of research on this uh, accreditation journey in Denmark. There are some of the papers here and maybe there are even more. For sure, Catriona and the team will share them with you. I think from this moment, we'd now continue with the other studies, the other cases, the experiences in Australia, Botswana and Jordan. So hopefully Karsten will join us, uh, but in the meantime, we just continue with after Denmark, we now continue to look at why was accreditation introduced. So why was it introduced in Australia? Next, Katriona. In Australia, reviews were published that patients did not always receive the care according to guidelines. So the government aimed to protect the public from harm and made accreditation mandatory. In Botswana, complaints about public health services triggered the ministry to introducing accreditation programs to improve the quality of their services. The ministry provi the urged providers to adopt the standards before legislation was put in place. In Jordan, accreditation started as a US aid project to organize regular inspection mechanisms in hospitals aiming to improve compliance with quality and safety requirements. The accreditation program was enrolled in a collaborative manner. So all four programs aim to improve quality and safety in health services through increased adherence to standards. Then how were the programs implemented? In Australia, standards were released before the assessment process commenced to provide the opportunity for health services to prepare for accreditation against the standards. A broad communication plan was rolled out to ensure health services were informed about the standards. And educational events were conducted to discuss the new standards. Health services could conduct self-assessments to track progress in implementing standards and quality improvement activities. In Botswana, Workshops were held with the ministry senior management and facility managers to introduce the program. And thereafter, workshops were held with a cross-section of personnel in each facility to understand the standards and to evaluate services against the standards. Training on quality improvement methods was also given. And to prepare for and follow up after the survey, hospitals and clinics captured standards compliance data and quality improvement activities into an online reporting system. Reports were generated to be reviewed and shared across all departments. And then Jordan. Jordan invested in educational activities on standard communication, standard scoring, assessment tools, and standard interpretation. And also manuals were provided that explain the standards and survey activities. Organizations undergoing the accreditation process are provided with a standard template to help them self-assess their performance. And they could also opt for a mock survey. Thus, all programs had preparation phases before conducting the accreditation survey, enclosing communication activities, education and training, and self-assessment tools. Then we go to the outcomes of accreditation. Australia. Well, Australia reported significant improvements in infection prevention outcomes and blood management. A lot of data was not available, but this, in this clinical outcomes, there were significant improvements. And when we look to patient experience, the results of accreditation were not publicly available. So it was found that consumers had little understanding of accreditation, just in the Danish case. And then staff experience, that was mixed. Hospital boards reported that they better understood their responsibilities and roles concerning patient safety and quality. However, in some facilities, the workforce felt that the organization was more concerned with ticking boxes than with the facility's performance due to the amount of resources spent on producing documentation to comply with accreditation requirements. And also concerns were raised that assessors misinterpreted the intent of the standards. And then Botswana. Botswana introduced accreditation in repetitive cycles. And not surprisingly, it was found that the highest increase in adherence was achieved in the first cycle, coming from under 40% of compliance reaching nearly 80%. 
but ongoing efforts lead to sustain and improve compliance levels above 90%. And this supported building a collective habit to adhere to quality and safety standards. Recalling Denmark, in Denmark, professionals expected that the ceiling would be reached and maintained after the first cycle. Uh, Katriona, one click please. However, when professionals underwent more than one cycle, this view was no longer supported. So it's important to continue. And then patient experience in Botswana, they were not reported, but adherence to standards about access to care and patient rights and patient rights was achieved. And also in Botswana, staff experiences were mixed. Both positive experiences were reported that staff felt more empowered, experienced ownership and better teamwork. And on the other hand, in some facilities, the program was experienced as time consuming and externally imposed. It's the ministry program, not ours. And then going to Jordan, as you can see, in many ways, accreditation improved the adherence to basic requirements of quality and safety in hospitals, like patient identification, medication safety, hand hygiene, incident reporting, and so on. The voice of the patient was better heard as the standards required the use of patient experience systems and complaints management as PDSA tools to measure and improve the quality of service. Overall, staff experience was positive. Initially, hospital leaders were in disbelief that their hospitals would not be in compliance with quality and safety requirements, but once in the programs, Leaders used the assessment reports as means to improve their services and reported that accreditation improved their workflow and accuracy. Staff felt better equipped to perform their job. And when resistance was found, it was often related to either a lack of knowledge and awareness of quality and safety or a lack of incentives to comply. So to go to a wrap up. What were critical success factors in all accreditation programs? With respect to context, the bad news of this webinar is there is no blueprint for successful program implementation. Accreditation remains a complex intervention in a complex adaptive system. However, it is helpful to have a well-resourced stakeholder at the national level, providing a continuous commitment to implement the program. And if you have it or not, it is crucial to establish ownership at the pro of the program at the facility level from the outset. And then critical success for factors for patient perceptions. When accreditation is introduced to improve quality and safety of care, it should be taken into account that, first of all, consumers have little understanding of accreditation but second, they expect to be safe. Patient satisfaction is a construct that requires knowledge of patients' expectations, previous experience, and the perceptions they have when they are entering a care system to fully understand their reported satisfaction, especially when pre-test and post-test groups are different patients you cannot easily compare the two. And then standards. There are a strong driver to empower patients. It is a way to assure the patient voice is heard in each step of the care process and at each level in the care system. And then critical success factors for staff perceptions. When introducing or sustaining accreditation in the health services, it should be noted that staff attitude towards accreditation influence their willingness to comply. Typically, the basic assumption is that accreditation is directly linked to increased staff workload and administrative burden. And the level of awareness and knowledge of quality and safety determines the program perception. I think, Karsten, that was where we lost you, that you really emphasized the importance of making sure staff is well-trained and well aware of how to work with quality and safety. 
I would like to give you a moment to, to break in and maybe add some comments because we lost you. Otherwise, I just continue. Looking at you, Karsten. You're on mute. Yes. What I would have said on the last slide that, that I, you unfortunately missed was that uh, <clears throat> um, accreditation should not be seen as some, something that accreditors or government do to healthcare providers. It's also not a project that the quality department manages to please the accreditor and gain a certificate, but while the rest of the organization minds their own business, it's an offer to an organization, a tool it can choose to use and integrate as part of its total management strategy. And I would I had referred to a Canadian study that pointed out some important factors for accreditation to have an effect. And I'll just see if I can find it. It's, it's three factors, coherence, there must be alignment between accreditation and the organization's beliefs, con context, and model of service delivery. There must be organizational buy-in which includes engaging the staff, and the organization must be able to action in response to observations, feedback, or self-realization that results from the accreditation process. Thank you, Ellen Joan. Thank you, Karsten. So to go back, we were with where the level of awareness and knowledge of quality and safety programs uh, strongly defer, uh, determines the perception of accreditation. So intrinsic motivation is higher when you are trained in quality assurance and improvement methods, and when you understand how standards impact quality and safety. We also found that resistance to change, as well as pre-accreditation job stress, was more prominent when staff experienced a fear to failure or repercussions for not being compliant. And to bridge the critical success factors to the accreditation bodies, when we say people make the difference, accreditation bodies should ascertain themselves that they help to set up their clients to facilitate their workforce to do so. So very simple, make sure the standards speak for themselves. Standards should clearly state expectation and stimulate reflection to improve. This allows care professionals to easily understand the why and the how of the standards and providing tailored on-the-ground support with educational activities and opportunities to exchange knowledge and experiences helps building awareness and knowledge of quality and safety in the client organizations. And we are knowledge workers in healthcare, so work with peer surveyors and provide peer support. So finally, critical success factors for the future. What are lessons learned for tomorrow? Quality is a habit, it's not a coincidence, especially in high risk industries such as healthcare. And accreditation is often managed as a project where it should be used as a tool to support understanding how quality is organized and sustained in your facility and how you can continuously improve the levels of your quality, safety and service experiences. All standards should be formulated in a way that they empower people, both people who deliver care as the people that receive care. You cannot give what you don't have and you don't want nothing about you without you. And focus of accreditation need to be broadened to managing quality in ecosystems of care rather than care institutions. The first promise to be fulfilled when you need care is that you are safe. And accreditation is a way to assure this in systems under pressure. And for sure, we know that will happen. So thank you all for your attention. And Karsten, over to you for your final words. Yes. And this is, this is just to highlight to you the opportunity to come and join a large proportion of the ISCO community when we meet in Istanbul in September this year. Um, this is from, for many ISCO members, that is one of the pinnacles of the year, one of the, one, one of the really good experience we wouldn't want to be without. And you can even still uh, have, have time to submit an abstract 
the call the call for papers is open until the 9th of February, and I hope to be able to greet many of you there. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That was a very interesting presentation, two presentations. Um, and again, if anybody's interested in looking at uh, and reading that, that paper, it's available in the International Journal for Quality in Healthcare. Um, so now we have a few minutes left, so I think we can we can probably go to the Q&A and um, we'll see what questions we have here. So <clears throat> I'll just go down to the, the earliest one here. So um, that's a tricky one, but <laughs> uh, we have a question there. What, what were the benefits of accreditation in Denmark, Karsten, in tangible terms? The, the, one, one, one way to put it, and, and I've heard many practitioners say this, is that it increased the, let's say, the structure and order of the way we are working. Uh, mm. you, it, 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 we, we, we had a review of, the, of, of some basic safety practices, and we found some errors, some, mm -hmm. some, uh, and, 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 we, and, and, and we corrected them. But I would I would also say that when we when we when we go and and this goes a little bit into one of the questions about the stepwise kind I think if you if you have a a, 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 a an accreditation program that rules on year after year you shouldn't go and examine the same things again and again you should also use the accreditation and the power of standards and external evaluation to promote national quality goals. If you have a goal you want to achieve for your country, put it into a standard, then everyone will be obliged to relate to it and they will get useful feedback and I'm sure it will drive improvement. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I have a question here from Joel, who's with EQUAM, Equam uh, Foundation in Switzerland, who do accreditations for primary care services. And um, he's asking then, is there a particular framing that might open the heart and mind of some of those 5% of GPs who had an extremely negative attitude? So um, any insights there? Well, uh, it, it can be, it, it's a little bit anecdotal, but it's based on my own experience from, from following surveys. Hmm. One of the objections we hear is that what you are asking for in the standard, you don't go into the core of what we're doing because standards usually are about the framing of the way we work, not about the actual clinical work. If you want to engage, one, one, one certain way to engage clinicians is, is asking them about the quality of their clinical work, in particular, in particular if you have indicator data to discuss from and, and uh, uh, where where they can demonstrate if they have actually improved. Yeah, so bringing them into the questions as well and not kind of making it so administrative, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah. great. Um, and here's um, a, a good question from Juan. Uh, will the use of artificial intelligence be considered as standard of safety, such as face recognition, claim to have a 99 and above percent accuracy um, with a, as an acceptable method of patient identification. Carsten, who's going? Uh, well, I mean, uh, techno technology is, 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 is um, developing all the time. And of course, accreditation standards should enable us to use the 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 used and most modern and efficient technologies, but they should also inspire us to consider carefully what risks there might be, and so and, and not in, introduce new technologies just because they are new, but because mm -hmm. we know what use 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 the questions we we showed you in the beginning of the paper. Why are we doing this? How are we doing it? And what we want to achieve by it, and then assess whether we whether we achieve it. Yeah, I guess it's it's kind of uh, just because you can do something, it doesn't mean you should. 
but we will actually in the next revision in, in the next next in, uh, version of the ISQA principles for accreditation standards we will introduce some meta principles on how to use uh, modern I, uh, AI IT technology that accreditors will then translate into actual standards. Yes, I agree to in addition what uh, Karsten is saying, accreditation bodies should really prepare themselves for how uh, this kind of techniques are introduced into healthcare. And for obviously it will change the way we look at safety and also it may help us to assist providing safe care to, um, to high demand. So we know we have shortage of staff, so we know we have to look at different ways and if artificial intelligence can be of help for sure we need to make sure that we allow that and that it's safe to do so so it will change definitely thank you uh, so there's another question here from juan <clears throat> could patient safety standards be regulatory rather than optional similar to the aviation industry standards of safety I think that's that's a good question, uh, Juan. Like all the other questions, so um, there is something difficult. Um, it's about the extrinsic and intrinsic motivation about this question. Um, I think every care organization that takes itself seriously should uh, should really want to comply with this kind of uh, patient safety standards uh, because we are in a high risk industry. So, but when you make it mandatory, uh, you create different incentives in the system, like the externally imposed, and that make it a bit contradictionary, especially when you look at the question where the resistance is from like the 5% of GPs. We all work in healthcare because we want to deliver good and safe care. So if you are able to, 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 to be at the heart of the care and the heart of the care professional, uh, you can be in the world of the intrinsic motivation. So, Carson, for sure, I think you want to add something to this answer. Yes, because, I mean, in the real world, these uh, many of the patient safety standards are regulatory in many countries. Mm. But we should try to switch the motivation from, as you say, from external to internal. We, 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 we do have to follow correct procedures for identification of, of patients. And, and if we if we make, if we harm a patient because not of not doing this, we will face or may face regulatory consequences. But we should we should try to say we do this, not because we have to, but because we want to. So that's the, that, that's the art. But it is a dilemma for accreditation that some of our standards are fairly close to being regulatory and other are, others are really aspirational. And that can be confusing for the message we send to the, uh, to, to, to the practitioners. And some of them see only the, the regulatory aspect, those who say it's control. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll just, I have another question here from Mariecki. Um, how do you feel about connecting or even integrating quality standards with other standards or frameworks? such as those related to information security or sustainability. This with the idea in mind that an integrated or holistic approach can help to bring about focus and to, to drive improvements. Yeah, um, I think I will start with that one. Thank you, Marike, for the question. Um, I think it's important that we look carefully how uh, and to what extent do we want to integrate. Uh, like, for instance, with information security, it is very clear that it highly impacts the daily work of care professionals. And if you uh, look to information security and just make sure the system is strong and um, uh, like waterproof, very often you cannot work with it. So it's about the behavior in the culture in the care institution that really says how well is this institution performing on information security. 
and it impacts the quality and safety both of the, the information and the privacy, the privacy, but also on the, the the care experience. So you cannot see them separate from each other. I think it's important to really integrate them, and especially also with the sustainability. Um, sometimes they are they tend to be or look like they are. Um, in in contradiction with each other. For instance, uh, with the sustainability, the use of like reusable or disposable instruments in the surgical theaters. Uh, the uh, reusables were in the history that we all had reusables, then we went to disposables, and but that's not sustainable. Now we go back to reusables and how do we guarantee safety? So you can you have to make sure you are looking in a holistic way. And then um, it's also important to go to a different part is that you really balance the standards. I also saw a question on there is a lot of on in, on the process. When you are working with accreditation, you should make sure there is a balance to standards that relate to like the procedures or like the aviation procedures, are we safe? Then you have a balance on system, on standards that need to be on systems. How do we monitor progress? How do we monitor the effect of improvement activities? And then you have to make sure that there are standards uh, that focus on behavior in the real world of your care professional in the front line at the moment that the service providers and service users interact. It's about the three. And if you focus on only one of the three too strong, you also um, create resistance to, uh, to accreditation. Um, Karsten, I go to you to make more sense on this answer. Well, I think, I think you made very much sense. I just add that sustainability is a part of, of, of healthcare quality and it will be included in accreditation standards of the, of the future, no doubt. It is already in, 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 in some standards. Great, thanks. Um, we're running out of time, unfortunately, but we might get uh, one or two more questions in. So another question there from Joel. Um, Based on your experience, would you recommend a stepwise kind of accreditation system with different levels to be achieved? And what are the pros or the cons? And do you have specific international examples in primary care? Yeah. Well, I think, Jewel, uh, when we look at, and I'm speaking for the accreditation body that I represent, Qualico Europe, uh, we started with a uh, with the thinking of stepwise accreditation because we noticed that when you start with accreditation you really have to to build knowledge on quality and safety and you have to build your quality management system so it's a uh, it's that is um, often perceived as time consuming because you're going to put a lot of knowledge and experience in your organization when you go to a second cycle it's about sustaining and it's about the first really thoroughly evaluation of your quality management system and how it performs in, in practice, in real life. And that's a very important cycle because there you are really going to integrate the quality knowledge into the themes of your system, of your organization. And then you go to the, to the, um, to the stage of continuous improvement and innovation. And it's a stimulation for organization that they can look where are we and what is needed for the first next step. So you stimulate them to, to grow and to celebrate what they what they reached. So I think it's wise to have a stepwise um, approach and make sure that wherever your client is, you can give uh, you can give him a perspective on a next level on working with quality from this intrinsic motivation. Karsten, the last minute is for you. You said it so well. I have nothing to add. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Great. Thank you both very, very much. Um, we won't get to any more questions, but if you want to send an email afterwards to fellowship at isqua.org um, with any questions that we didn't get around to, I can uh, contact the speakers and um, hopefully they'll have an answer. Um, and just to remind everybody, there is there is a paywall um, for this um, journal article. We've had a few um, 
messages in the chat. So this is um, as part of ISCO membership, you do have access to the International Journal for Quality in Healthcare. So if you do want to access that and you have an ISCO membership, just make sure you log in there through the ISCO website and you'll be able to go directly to the, to the journal. Um, you could join ISCO, of course. We want more members. We love to have more members. Um, and um, additionally, you can pay for access to the journal separately. So um, just to let you know that we were unable to provide a PDF uh, because it is behind a paywall. Um, but we are delighted that we could share the examples and and the, the learnings from this, this article today and very grateful to have Ellen Joan and Karsten. Um, and we will just edit this recording slightly and upload it to YouTube. And if you um, have anyone in your network who would also be interested in watching this, please feel free to share the link and um, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. But for now, I think I just want to say a massive thanks to you both and um, hope you have a, a lovely day or evening or night for the rest of you um, all over the world. Um, and it's been a, it's been a great first webinar for 2024. So thank you so much.